30 clicks. Click, click, click. And then you'll be good to go. Let's go into this adventure. No one on one. He's Wolf, an interstellar adventurer and quite a guy. She's Nikki, a young rebel from Earth stranded on a desert planet, and she knows how to take care of herself. By the way, my name is Paul, and I'm trying to take care of this week's podcast, and it ain't easy, because when they met, it was meant to be an adventure. This is the Cop Faction Podcast, episode 103, Spotlight on Space Hunter, Adventures in the Forbidden Zone. Super nice. <laughs> it's a bit loud. Very loud. I thought you were going to be able to hope that you knew you were home. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that's what I thought you were going to do. But it did go oh, no. with adventure. And also, the fact that I had an inkling that he didn't like it, so I had to change it slightly. Gave <laughs> you that idea. Three <laughs> way. Hello! <laughs> Hi! <laughs> I don't know whether it's going down in volume or not. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Cult Faction Podcast episode 103, where this week we have the spotlight on a 1980s classic, Space Hunter, Adventures in the Forbidden Zone. I am Paul Hawkins, your host for this evening, and as ever, I am joined by... Brett Summers and Damien Hicks. Hey. We're all here. We're all here. Yeah. We're all ready to play. Okay, we are talking. Or we are going to be talking about Space Hunter: Adventures in the Forbidden Zone, one of the longest um, film titles ever. Can, can we just call it Space Hunter from now on? Yeah, let's do that. Uh, um, but before we get it into doesn't that, doesn't deserve any more of my breath. Don't, don't give anything away. Spoilers. <laughs> Uh, before we do that, let's have a quick round up. Anyone been up to anything interesting this week that we want to talk about, Brett? I went to Monkey World. Cool. That's quite it's a t-shirt, I guess. Yeah. Uh, monkeys there, and they were in a world of their own. Well, yeah. Was it their own, or was it... Oh, they seem to be having fun. It's a sanctuary, isn't it? They're, they're not monkeys. They're not taken from the world, and they're actually... Well, they're they were saved. taken from the world, but they were taken from the world in a previous life. They've been rescued. Reincarnated like no. Jurassic Park. No. <laughs> yeah, they're not amber moulds. Cool. So was it fun? Yeah, no, it was good. All the kids enjoyed it. And they all left tired. And it's a stroke day tomorrow. Hey, What more could you want? Cool, so news has to be up nice and early then. <laughs> no guarantees. <laughs> Damien, you've been up to anything interesting? Um, I've suddenly found myself giving guitar lessons. To? Two people. The hey. wife and a friend. Who's the friend? Stu. Yeah. Oh, big shout out to Stu and the wife. Is, is she got some plans to make it a family band or something? No, it just wants to learn guitar. So. And hey, I, we've I, all I, been I, through that phase. I need to learn the patience of guitar. a teacher. <laughs> you need to <laughs> learn patience yeah. by Guns N' Roses. No, you don't need to learn that. It's <laughs> very simple. Road, show. <laughs> Uh, other than that, not a lot, really. Cool. Okay, yeah, not, nothing yeah. worth talking about yeah. for me. So let's go into what we've been watching. Yeah. I'm going to come to you first, Summers. Okay, I followed your advice and the advice of my girlfriend, Kate. Hello. And watch. Thank you, Miss Patsy. Because you both said this was... Oh, God, I'm trying to think about what I suggested now. Uh, don't worry, darling. The, I said give it a go, see yeah, what you think. The um, Harry Styles, Florence Pugh, directed by a little Well, old Florence film. Pugh, Harry Styles. Let's get them the right way round, shall yeah, we? Yeah, I think that's fair enough. <clears throat> yeah, anyway. No, it's fair enough, but he's first on the post of some of them in the picture. Um, also, Chris Pine's in it and Gemma Chan. Um, I liked it. I thought it was really good, but... Man, they signposted every worry fit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but like, <clears throat> even the bits where they thought they were being clever, they weren't, and it was... Well, I didn't of... know whether they did think they were being clever or whether they, you know, thought, like many people have before, we've got an American market, we've got a Western market, we need to spoon-feed them 
information. Yeah, but even the really clever bits, like the the name of the band and some of the books that were on shelves and things, were sort of. And the songs that were playing were all um, slightly overdone. And um, I, but I enjoyed the film. It is one hundred percent worth a watch. But I called every twist and turn <laughs> in it, in, even the bit at the end. All I right. it bit by bit exact. Well, obviously you were there with your notepad and pen. Well, no. Making notes. It's Ooh, all been there's a song that but, they're playing. We're going to write that down. But the interesting thing is, do you know who wrote this? Who? Did you not see who wrote? Because it says it came up. It was written by Shane and Carrie Van Dyke, along with Katie Silverman. The Shane Van Dyke who ended up being the grandson of Dick Van Dyke in Dionysus Murder. Oh. The, the little blonde one. Yeah. They're all like scriptwriters and all that now. Cool. So, yeah, it was good, but it, I just thought it, this was... It, it could have been, there could have been many improvements, but it, it wasn't that bad. Yeah, everyone in it is really good. I mean, Styles is probably the weakest, but then, you know, he's not an actor-actor yet, is he? You know, he's learning his craft still. There's a fucking microphone! I wonder where it was. <laughs> I mean, is there any more eyes at me? Yeah, so <laughs> if only that were true. If only there wasn't video evidence of you not speaking into your microphone now. I mean, YouTube basically sees the back of your head for most of it. <laughs> that's like most videos on the internet. <laughs> okay, so but that's one. Danny, let's move to you because I'm never sure if you've got many things to talk about or, or not. I have very little to talk about. Okay, well, let's for move. For, uh, as per my previous conversation, I've been catching up, or rather, Sarah and I have been catching up on Van der Valk. Oh yeah, which is the reboot of the eighties, I guess. Um, Texas. Who was the original? I was trying to think this year. I don't know. No idea. It, I mean, I, I want to say he was just some old grey-haired dude, but he was probably about thirty. <laughs> just because like, obviously it was the eighties, we were a lot younger. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's just a, conti- a continuation of, of that reboot. It's um, Mark Warren is playing the titular Piet Van der Valk. Um, they fixed a few issues from the previous season or two seasons I can't remember um, some of the cast have left they've been replaced with you know perfectly adequate um, robots no perfectly <laughs> adequate replacements but one of the things about the previous season is there's a really 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 cool um, pathologist he's like he's quite he's the guy in the film you know what we were talking about the show oh the, the show week. yeah he was the, on the, the one that went missing the James yeah. was it his name Jim or something yeah that Jim, guy yeah so it's him. He plays the pathologist. But in this, he's really cool. He's like a drug-taking jazz aficionado and a bit of a lady. He's just an all-round cool dude. But out of the entire like three-episode run of each season, he probably gets about ten minutes. Right. They fix that. He now goes on their adventures with them. It's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> he's been up. He's been up. It's like he's now pretty much like a, a Nicky in um, Silent Witness. So he's out there solving the crimes as well, instead of just turning up to say there's a blood stain on the knife. Now, is he going to get his spin off? That would be awesome. <laughs> and the other thing is, they make the the thing they didn't do in season one or two. I can't. Remember, I don't know what number season this is. It might be three, or it might even just be two. I can't remember. Um, they didn't really make the most of the fact they're in Amsterdam. Right. So you know, like, so now the, now yeah. he can really enjoy his part. And no, no, I don't mean that. But, you know, <laughs> when they do these regional. Nice. Um, <laughs> Detective dramas like Vera, or yeah, yeah, yeah. they they use the, the the place they're set becomes part of the character. Yeah. It's the character, yeah. is it? Like, as much of a, like Death and Paradise. Yeah, instance. exactly. That, but they didn't really do that before. It was almost always almost in yeah, the yeah. building, if you like. Yeah. But there's more out, more going on outside. More canals. Can it, yeah, a lot more canals. And bicycles. But it just gives you a better feeling of where they are because it's supposed to be set in Vanderbilt. In Vanderbilt. In Amsterdam. Uh, so that I think that's the only thing I've watched. I mentioned um, the Yellow Jackets last week, didn't I? Yeah. yeah. You normally mention that. Mm-hmm. No, I don't. I don't <laughs> okay, cool. So I watched last. It's just, it's just itching to just. It's all about him, isn't it? No, you said you've only watched well, one thing. Hosting. You didn't give me a chance to like actually say, "Yep, that's me done." Oh no! Yeah. <laughs> I'm just trying to keep the pace yeah, going for our viewers and our yeah, listeners. I, I got cut off as well. <laughs> okay, so what's the last episode of the Silo on Apple TV? Yeah, you oh. said that last week. No, I didn't. Yeah, you did. Mm, you did. Because it only just dropped this week, last week. So I only watched it over the week on Friday. Yeah, you did. Mm. 
Get it! <laughs> I watched what I thought could have been the last episode, but it wasn't the last episode. It's Spoilers. definitely the last episode now. Is it worth watching then? Does it play off at the end? Without yeah. Spoiling it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It absolutely does. I'm not going to spoil it. Um, but yeah, looking forward to Just season two because we know there is going to be a season two. Yeah. Um, staying with Apple TV, trying to get my money. Um, Hijack. Oh uh, yeah, I want to watch that. And it's, but I saw a bit of it on Gogglebox. Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, they told us the first episode. Basically. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so this is Idris Alba. He plays negotiator. He's on an aeroplane trying to get back to his estranged yeah, wife that doesn't want him. Yeah, um, and lo and behold, get that from Gogglebox. there's a hijack on the plane. And he's trying to defuse the situation and negotiate terms and conditions. Or is he? Have you just ruined the cliffhanger for the end of the first episode? No. Are you sure? Yeah, because we mm. find out that he's negotiating. What? In the first episode? Yeah. Okay. No, it wasn't mentioned. It Google wasn't mentioned Box. on Gogglebox. Because it looked like he goes, I don't care about any of this. I just want to get home. Yeah, I, I, yeah, actually, I don't give a shit. Yeah. He actually and then shit. it ends. That, see, that episode ends. Anyway. First two episodes, no. <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> the first three episodes are now available on but, Apple TV. And, and the pilot is the British guy who was the doctor in that one on the yeah. beach. Surely, yeah. Oh, he's, been, he's an yeah. all round sort of proper character actor. I'm sure like he coupling did and a, sorts. Yeah, coupling. I'm sure he did a Fools and Horses, but I think I'm thinking no, of the, thinking the of... woman in coupling who was Groovy Gang. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah. well, it's fact he looks—he does look quite. Now he looks a lot like the yeah, other the, yeah. Uh, courier. Yeah, so I I think it's all right. Um, it's one of those things where I can't. Hopefully, it's not going to go on for seven series. Um, it's a long flight. Yeah, it could have just been a film. All I need is halfway through. He says, "Always bet on black." <laughs> <laughs> but so far, so good. <laughs> Brett, was coming back to you. 57 Wesley Snipes before yeah, I know anyone you, tries yeah. to cancel me. <laughs> I was quoting a film. Back to you. may be similar. Back to me. I have watched episode two of Secret Invasion, the Marvel limited series or special event, whatever you want to call it. I watched the first one. It's all right. As I say, it's building up. It's a, it's a yeah. tension thing. They're trying to do a... It's almost a bit 24-like, I think. I think they're trying to sort of... The espionage, who do you trust, and and all that. Um, there's a bit of a cliffhanger at the end of this episode two, which yeah, if you paid attention, it would be a cliffhanger. I got to be honest, I'm not that fussed about going back for episode two, so I'm going to let you continue to watch it. Oh, at, you know I will, I and then maybe it. tell me if it's actually worth it. It's just, it just at the moment, it just reminds me of Twenty Four, where it's just frustrating because you just want to watch it. All of it, where you've got to wait now, because you get that little bit. They feed you that little bit, then you've got to wait for the next one, and then the next one. But it's definitely Samuel L. Jackson. Um, I think they've like, you know, show whatever range you want to show in this. And he's like, now I'm angry, now I'm emotional, now I'm there. And it's kind of, I think they're doing a bit of that with him. And also you're getting, you get a lot of the flashbacks to the sort of, 90s Captain Marvel era where he's got you know like before he had the eye patch and all that so you're you're getting a bit of both so to speak okay and uh, yeah it's, it's doing all right but people will moan in but they will anything else no nah, that's been about it for me because then it was um, Money in the Bank live from London at the weekend so I watched that because it's nice to watch WWE at eight o'clock and not three <laughs> and not three AM. <laughs> so you actually made it through the whole lot. Yeah, yeah well, I did full sleep. Cool. Okay, so carrying on with Apple TV, the crowded room, um, with Tom Holland. So Spider Man, huh? Spider Man. Well, apparently he does other stuff as well. Ooh. Uh, this, this being one of them. Um, so he plays a kind of. Um, Teenager? Yeah, gets kicked out of school, well, kind of runs away from school, ends up living with this Is he? Israeli. <laughs> We're not quite sure what he does, but no one messes with him, otherwise, he messes them up. Um, there's been a couple of murders. Police are basically questioning him, think he's guilty, or think that the Israeli and his flatmate may have done it. It's all right. 
it's it's weird because he yeah the, the character he plays is really greasy and slimy and um a bit peter parker parker-esque in his way that he's not very good with girls and doesn't really know what's going on um but it's okay it's a, it's a bit different and you know it's got serial killer potential vibes going to it and, I, and I'm trying to get my money from Apple TV, as I said. Um, because I was bored and on my own and wanted an action film on Sunday, I downloaded Fast X. Uh. <clears throat> well, it is what it is. You know, it's lots of cars, action sequences. And... Is that the one where they end up in space? No, no, that, that was the, the last one, I think. So see, this one is just being released for, for streaming. It's okay. It's not gonna, you know, it's not gonna break a genre. Let's put it that way. Um, and and do you think it's just because everyone's got ADHD now that these films are cool? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I, can't, I can't. I've tried watching some of them. I can't even get a fun enjoy. You know, like it's so shit. It's funny kind of thing. I, I know. There's, get that. No, there's definitely one of them that is. That um, I think it's the one before the space one, where they're they're literally driving cars in uh, out in um, middle east somewhere and they're going from one skyscraper to another and it's like yeah that, that's so shit it's actually quite funny um the whole space one no um but yeah it's it's okay but that they they deliberately ended it on a cliffhanger so there's another one they, there's no closure to this one so they obviously need more money um bigger paychecks i, I mean, think as long as as long as they're making money they're not going to stop no, exactly. Oh, yeah. It's, and, you know, it's got... And it's definitely got a fan base. I mean, there's like 10, 11 movies and, and a spin-off. Wasn't there a... Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Rock and Jason Stone did a spin-off one as well, yeah. didn't they? Uh, and it's got all the stars. I mean, these are big name stars in it. Like, Gal Gaddo, I think, only pops up for a couple of seconds because she's in the, the, the next one, no doubt, in, in more. Jason Momoa is okay. He plays a kind of a camp uh, killer. Um, he does it well. Um, but yeah, as I said, it's it's not going to break any genres with this one. Um, and the only other thing that I watched, just because it started playing, and it was ding, 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 and I watched the whole of Footloose. Um, I was I, literally only switching on for a couple of minutes um, and ended up watching all of it. That is the original, not the 2000s yeah, yeah. remake, obviously. <laughs> the, the Bacon. Yeah. Bacon be thy name. Mm. And that's me, Dan. <laughs> Anyone need a piss? Anyone need? No, let's Anything? do it. Let's do it. Okie dokie. Oh, we'll be done by 10 if we make a start oh. now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Damien wants to talk about this too long. <laughs> I did make try and make the paragraphs as even as I could. before it will be probably down come on you are first <laughs> and it's safe to put the headphones on again so space hunter uh, Adventures in the Forbidden Zone is a 1983 American slash Canadian space western film. You can't have too many space western films. Especially not in the early 80s. <laughs> Ivan Reitman was the film's executive producer and it was directed by Lamont Johnson. When the film was originally released in theatres, it was shown in a polarised over-under 3D format. The film became part of that kind of 3D revival craze in the early 80s. Uh, and was released just before Return of the Jedi. 
uh, literally, I think, uh, week some the, like, yeah. the week before. Um, it was made on a budget of circa $14 million and made over $2 million in profit. Um, and whilst not a major box office smash, it still became a home video star. Made more profit than some films recently. <laughs> Uh, and for a change, that <laughs> I don't think it was nominated for a Saturn Award, unlike uh, most of the films that we talk about. Um, so the main cast included Peter Strauss as Wolf, with two Fs, Molly Ringwald as Nikki, Ernie Hudson as Washington, obviously, uh, Michael Ironside as Overdog, and uh, worthy mention for Harold Ramis, who um, is a voice on the intercom. It's not actually mentioned in the credits. So the one on Here we go. List, Here we go. You missed out Deborah Pratt, who played Megan, the darker-haired girl of the three girls that get kidnapped. Now, she started as an actress. Does it ring any bells? Was she, she in the Hear No Evil, See No Evil? Was that the, no. Oh, she okay. started as an actress and then later moved see into no a writer happened. and producer... And ended up uh, writing and producing a little show called Quantum Leap, oh, where she ended up also being the voice of Ziggy. You can you can tell me this, yeah, I'm, and I'm, look I'm, at I'm the like, You don't have like to look, look at me. I look at people when I'm talking. It's what happened. We're talking Which is to great each other when you're having a conversation in the pub. <laughs> I'm still talking but when into you're the trying microphone. to record a pod. You be, you're not because the microphone in my ears. stays where it is. Your face goes ears. all the way over oh, here. And you come, come, then you come back in again. Then bully, you come over there and you bully, talk about this. Then you come back in again. Do, do we need to get one of those Madonna mics? Or Britney no, Spears No, we mics? need to get him a neck brace. <laughs> and she was so on the horses. <laughs> <laughs> and she also was the narrator, Quantum Lee, and is behind the revival, which is currently doing That's cool. Well. That's really good to know. So if it wasn't for that, if it wasn't for Space Hunter... Adventures in the Forbidden Zone, you may never have got Quantum Leap. That's not strictly true, is it? She was the big part of it. And is keeping it all She going. was not a big part of this film. Quantum Leap. Oh, okay. Yeah, but but on about Space Hunter, Adventures yeah, no, in the Forbidden saying, Zone. Without this film, Damien may never have got Quantum Leap. Well, so maybe that's, you... a, that's, a, that's a very so has strong to... leap to make. I he has to thank this film. No, I don't. Because <laughs> oh, she had... A, had... A non-speaking part. She spoke. Well, no, she did speak, to be did fair. She? she went, ah, at oh, least okay. once. Yeah, fair enough. Sorry, and there's a bit at the end as well where yeah. one of them said something. We'll go to your planet. Yeah. Anyway, memories are made of this. So, um, Damien, any memories of this film? None whatsoever. Okay. Never heard of it. Okay. <sighs> you wish I hadn't. Okay, moving on to Brett. Brett, any memories of this film? I went to the cinema to see this. Cool. I remember the 3D glasses. It was the normal cheap ones you always got. There was yeah. nothing printed on the it. The back of a cornflake packet type yeah, stuff. Yeah, those ones. And um, it was, yeah, I remember like it being quite freaky. Because I, I think it was more the Michael Ironside overdog gimmick was kind of, that was the main bit of the 3D after the space travel. And um, And I remember being freaked out by the lady at the beginning when it when there was a twist as to what she was. Oh, I thought yeah. you meant when she was just wearing a shirt and, and, and nothing else. And I was like, oh, mummy, am I allowed to watch this? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God, it's in 3D. Brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> I remember it being freaky when she melted. Cool. Anything else? No. Okay, I remember loving this film, watching it pretty much constantly on VHS. Love the Scrambler, or whatever it's called, the the, the vehicle that he yeah. drives. Um, and yeah, I, I, I've watched it many, 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 many times. But anyway, that's memories. Let, let's make new memories, because we've watched it over the last week. Um, and let's do what we normally do when we walk through the film. We may chip in with any points that we want to make yeah. that are particularly great scenes that we want to discuss. Um, and go about how you know the highlights of this film really shone uh, and maybe made us smile, laugh, and get excited. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, Damien, I know I know you're keen to kick off, so let's, let's, I am. let's start wait with you. I'm going on this. Okay, so rousing 80s action military band music 
you're already over said in this. <laughs> He's out over moving Starfield, uh, over a moving Starfield. <coughs> Do you think any 80s sci fi film where the starship is travelling at light speed? A space cruise liner tours a nebula and is struck by plasma lightning, which is really frustrating when that happens. Showers of spark light fill the screen as we see an escape pod jettison just before the liner explodes. The escape such will crash. I can't itch my ear and read at the same time. <laughs> you weren't in the mic either. Yeah. The escape shuttle crashes to a desert planet and the only apparent survivors are three beautiful women. Nova, Rena and Me- Megan or Megan? Megan. It's Megan, is it? Oh, we, we'd probably say Megan, but yeah. in the States they pr- probably say Megan. I'm sure I had Megan. In the anyway. forbidden zone, it's yeah. Megan. They're quickly accosted by the hostile natives who turn up in a Mad Max style vehicle in space where no one can hear you scream. <laughs> we listen to a message being played concerning lots of outstanding debts and an alert is broadcast for the safe return of the women with a reward of 3,000 mega credits. <laughs> a small time salvage operator named Wolf has been listening and wakes his female engineer Chalmers. As this is an 80s film, Chalmers is wearing an almost see-through shirt and very little else. Just some tighty whities We learn that the planet they have, they have to rescue the escape pod from is Terra 11. A failed colony that fell victim to a deadly plague and civil warfare. Wolf decides to risk the dangers, <coughs> pay off his debts and his alimony. Yeah, I'm not going to lie, it was a bit of a ropey start. Yes. Um, all of the visuals, um, <coughs> I, I don't know. Oh, it's 3D, obviously. So maybe they were... That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah it, of course it was. That was the only reason that we got those bright letters coming towards us and we had the star field. Because if you were sat there with your red and blue lenses, that would have looked mm-hmm. It amazing. was very much, to me, and I remembered it when I watched it, it was almost... Um, Basically, straight off of the Christopher Reeve Superman movie, it was almost like the same font, same style, but but in three D. Yeah. yeah, and with a more of an A Team type theme tune. Yeah, that was. I thought it was a bit more westerny. It reminded me of the a kind of shite, but <laughs> but it reminded me of a kind of let's round them all up and get the evil gang. Dun, well, dun, yeah, dun, like, dun, 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 they've gone dun, to the composer. Dun, dun. We're making a space western, and he's gone. Doo, doo, doo. I can't whistle, so. <laughs> that's what he's got. That's what he's done in his head. But this, and then expanded on it. But this was, like we said, this is a week before Return of the Jedi. They they penciled that in on purpose. They were going for that. And they have tried so hard to get everything in that no, like this is the this is definitely like film executives. Trying to make a cash in on another film, right? We need, we need a lovable rogue. We Who's need... the cool one from Star Wars yeah. that everyone loves? We've got a robot, <clears throat> and she's a girl. That's two for one. That is a spaceship. We need that light stuff when it goes fast. Yeah. Mega <clears throat> credits. <laughs> to, to be fair, the, the, and they're the... on a desert in that Star Wars film, aren't they? Because they even did a bit later on, we'll get to when they're walking along, and you get that kind of music, only it's not R2 and Freebio. Yeah. Yeah. All it needed was, was, was slides at, from each scene. You know, yeah. They, yeah. they didn't quite go that far. So th- there's no beating around the bush. Um, li- there's no preamble. We, we get the space liner, and then it basically blows up. Um, so we don't even get to see anyone on there. There's no. no so we got no. There's no shop. There's no. <laughs> it's not like that ghost ship where we get yeah. everyone's backstory. Yeah. We we don't even see the three women. No. Until they, um, they all, already all, land on the planet. All we needed was them in a the corridor doing the old Shatner left and right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, oh, it's been shook. And or then we something. Yeah, you know, having a good time but, watching the view. But the thing is that as well is they genuinely went for it in this film. This isn't a. Quick, well, it is, it is a cash in because they're trying to rip it off. But, but this is actually they spent money on this. This is like, it's not a uh, one of these like straight to video thing. They went for this big time. This is you know they they shot their bolt and kind of this. But um, yeah, 
that's what makes it more shocking <laughs> that they didn't have little shots like that like you say those bits in there yeah so anyway we build up the hand solo figure wolf really macho name no messing about there Charmers, we get the eye candy for the dads, uh, as it would have been in the 80s. Yeah. And she's a robot, said so two for one. Yeah, we don't know this at the point. Oh, yeah. Um, spoilers. Three women land, and they're wearing some really weird alien garb, and they take it off to re reveal that they're three... Well, I mean, it's outside beautiful, but, you know, it's 80s hairstyles. Yeah. Uh, that was <laughs> never... A, Straight on... out of a Motley Crew video. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah. Wolf's going there to pay off his debts. We don't know why, why he's got the debts, do we? Yeah. Well, there's a long list. There's rent overdue. Oh, yeah. there's his wife's ex wife oh, has been right. asking for money. Yeah. There's something else I can't remember. He's a rogue. I'm yeah. surprised he got married in the first place. Mm. Anyway. He is the, he's the blueprint for um, <laughs> what's his name in Guardians of the Galaxy? Star Lord. Yeah, he's, just, he's off gallivanting in the universe. Cool. <laughs> okay, Brett. Okay, after landing on the barren world, and depending on what version you see, as they land on the barren world, sometimes you see the end of the road and there's a car park in a station. <laughs> but um, that's um, that was on the British release. Um, yes, yeah, so after landing on the barren world, Wolf and Chalmers set out. That's like someone from the Bill set out in a cool <laughs> four-wheel drive vehicle. With a large gun turret called the Scrambler. I love that car. Which is clearly made to be a toy. <laughs> yeah. This is, I mean, they've got merchandise in their eyes here. Yeah. Unfortunately, never, none of it came out. They travel over the Martian like terrain and find and detect a signal from the escape pod, but it's moving. Also, then they see a large pirate ship esque kind of train pirate ship approaching a blockage on the tracks and it starts being attacked by a band on motorbikes sci-fi motorbikes yeah uh, wolf and charmers join the battle between the marauders who are the zoners and the band of nomads the scavs <laughs> i thought about this <laughs> wolf Swashbuckles his way through the ranks of foes, but before he can rescue the three survivors, the zoners take the women away unceremoniously on jet powered hand gliders. Wolf learns from the scavs that the women were taken into the zone, which is ruled by Overdog, the sworn their sworn enemy. Returning to the scrambler, Wolf finds that Chalmers revealed to be a genoid or robot chick has been killed so he decides to melt her down instead of saving her body and trying to repair her yeah <clears throat> so we get to see the cool yeah, car yeah you could have just put some circuitry back together yeah. well yeah that, and that's what i was thinking it's like no it's and i think so that, that was just <laughs> the self-destruct mode yeah and i think that was probably the most expensive <clears throat> shot in the movie yeah you're half as better than like go save Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what I did like that just right when they landed, you did get a bit of Overdog's mm -hmm. backstory. They said that I've forgotten his actual name now, but they went, "Oh, it's General So and So So and So Overdog," and he was. Oh, did they the say that? Because I was going to say it. I was going to mention. I mean, he's, he was supposed to be a doctor or something. Yeah, they they say I mean, what he was, what but kind then of he, doctor then he, calls himself Overdog. But then he went. He went crazy with the... Plastic surgeon probably does. He went yeah. crazy with the radiation or something. and Yeah. Or, but they did... It's like a one-sentence sort of thing. Oh, right. I clearly missed that. Okay, but, um, so, so let's talk about what I thought were some of the positives. The vehicles, the the, <coughs> the amount of money spent on that ship thing, positives. train. Um, I thought that was quite good. Obviously, um, Lucas saw or must have got word of this because hey that that battle um that swashbuckling adventure straight out of return <laughs> the, the r2d2 sound is used in the film i don't <laughs> know where there is an r2d2 bit where it goes, and it's the sound it's r2d2 um the kidnapping where the girls are taken off on the um hand gliders is quite obvious that they are just stuffed dummies <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> as, they're, as they're just swinging along. It's very... That, that reminded me a bit of Kroll. 
You know, yeah, they steal her from the wedding and the sort of off she goes and doesn't really serve any purpose dare. apart from <laughs> mention crawl in the same sentence as and Space Hunter Adventures in the Forbidden Zone. And then we get poor Chalmers being basically disintegrated because he couldn't be asked to repair her. Or sell her for scrap, he's desperate for money. But even so, no, I think it was a mark of respect. I don't I'm not gonna leave you here to be scavenged. We could have put a, in the bloody big car that he's driving. It's and not like he's shot on space, is he? But the the what got me of it as well is like she kind of got shot. It wasn't that clear that it was a bad wound or whatever. But that was the thing they were building up the suspense, you see, until she cuts to the yeah. right hand side of her face, and we can see the circuitry. Yeah, yeah, but even if she'd sort of reacted to being shot rather than like. Or something where you thought, oh no, is she okay? Is she going to die? Yeah, or whatever. No, well, and then the you get the so shuffle of. Throughout the film, the editing is shit. Yeah, which I think that kills, kills the narrative. a lot of it. Yeah, and it was also a bit um, what would you call it? I don't know. The the battle scenes are very like explosion, jump cut, jump cut, explosion. You know, it's almost like you yeah, know, it's just someone had a lot minute, of coffee. He's swinging across to the sail. The next minute, he's on, he's below deck, <laughs> shooting up at a. Just shoot, scavenger just, or whatever. Just shooting up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um but again, you can see that they're genuinely trying with this. The other people the other you know, the the the, the we're gonna talk about this in a minute, I'm not sure if it's this but you know the bit where the is it the old man, I forgot they called him. No, this is already in that scene. Yeah. The the, the old man from the scavs that was used to be with the overdog, yeah. Yeah. And all that, you know, they've got nice sort of background characters to to, to drop yeah, the they've got, bits they've of got plot some, and all some, that, but it yeah. doesn't seem to. They're be trying there. to build a universe here. Yeah. yeah, you've got a whole backstory about whatever happened on the planet. Then you've got the old dude who seems to know everything and is trying to explain stuff. But no, quick, move on. Time to go. Yeah, and the t- the two brothers we meet who are with the old dude, and you know, they seem a bit feisty. We we might see them later. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's move on. So, Wolf continues on alone, but he soon catches up with a teenage human, Nikki, uh, who's basically trying to steal his scrambler as he's investigating the remains of a strange UFO filled with skeletons. She convinces Wolf that he needs her as a tracker if, he's, if he is to survive the zone. And Wolf reluctantly takes her on in an exchange for food. In the meantime, the three women land in the zone. And we're introduced to the chemist, the chief henchman of Overdog, who explains how he hopes the prisoners don't have any scars or missing limbs, as the Overdog won't like that. Meanwhile, Wolf and Nicky make up camp and prepare dinner and get ready for bed. Wolf in his nice comfy blow-up metallic sleeping bag and Nicky left alone to fend for herself in the cold. Um, yeah. And meanwhile, the, the chemist drugs the woman with a mood enhancer and prepares them for dog's pleasures. But who doesn't? Uh, who doesn't like that kind of thing on a Saturday night? So... But what can he do? He's, <laughs> yeah, he's literally <laughs> just a head with oversized arms. Yeah, we don't know this at the moment. Um, so first of all, we're introduced to Nicky. Um, the weird thing for me about this is that Wolf finds the crashed UFO. He makes his way in there, um, and there's loads of skeletons. And then Nicky's having a conversation that you know, a family crashed here. He said, and it's like, yeah, but they're in there. It's like she didn't know about it. <laughs> it's yeah. like there's lots of skeletons in there. They're your family, they're aren't like they? Skeletons in their closet. <laughs> she killed them all. Yeah. Ooh. But again, that's this is another pointless part of the thing. He's in there, he's investigating stuff, and then he and comes out. Ten seconds of yeah, yeah, yeah. And the UFO looks like it's from a film in the fifties as well. That would have been Hollywood props. Yeah. But yeah, but Nikki is she's a feisty one, isn't she? You know, we get a bit of that. She's had to be. She's living on her own in in, in the in the badlands, basically. The chemist is very weird and creepy. I like the chemist well, for what he is. I, I, I don't know. Uh, I... He reminds me of like um, 
the dude Peter, Peter Wingard played in Flash Gordon, the creepy kind of, the, but he had a mask on in that, the black, Zy, I forgot what he's called now, Clytus. Yeah, yeah but... But the, the creepy sidekick who just trying the, to... The like, chemist seemed a bit kiss more ass a bit. camp and... <laughs> Like he should have been in the Rocky Horror Picture Show, more of a evil henchman or a nineteen twenties vampire, Alfred Frankenstein film. <laughs> yeah, something like that. James um, Whale. But yeah, it's basically setting up that you know the chemist. There's talk of the overdog. We haven't seen the overdog yet, and we know that there's bad things afoot for the three uh, women if and when they get to the overdog. They're getting overdogged. Maybe. Mm-hmm. Let's plow on then, shall we? <laughs> As the overdog would say. Wolf wakes up with Nikki cuddling into him and dunks her in a nearby water hole and forces her to wash. They then come under attack by a strange plough like vehicle. Wolf manages to disable the machine and we find out the driver is a former military pal of his, a soldier named Washington, who reveals that he too has come to rescue the woman. Wolf refuses to help his rival and leaves him to fend for himself. Wolf and Nikki continue on their way, stopping off in an abandoned structure to shelter from the dangers of the night. There they are awakened by strange noises and go to investigate. They are attacked by fat, mutated humanoids. They slide down conveniently placed ropes and set off into the scrambler. Yeah, so it's a lot's going on here. First of all, a teenage girl is cuddling into Wolf um, and doesn't seem to have a problem with that, apart from the fact that she's smelly. So then goes up and washes her a few times. Smelly girls. Uh, I and I don't know how old uh, she was at the filming of this, but... Um, well, this is pre... Yeah. This is pre all the Johnny <clears throat> Hughes films, so it's... Yeah. So, <laughs> and, and those are problematic enough in itself. Yeah. So bearing in mind, this is potentially three years before Pretty in Pink. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and 16 Candles. 16 Candles. That's the one. Yeah. Yeah. So, <clears throat> yeah... It, there's there's a few issues with this yeah. scene, but anyway, we're but, but Wolf doesn't <coughs> promote anything, does he? You know, she snuggled into him while he was asleep, so he's still. No, you're around. right, but it's the dunking her in the water so that her clothes get wet and cling to her, and it's and just all a bit wrong. Yeah, yeah, the point. I just, um, like that. I just thought she was a smelly girl. If she was. 18, 19 when she made the film and in this playing acting, a fifteen year old, 15 year old yeah. and that's a different kettle. Of, it's not. It's, it has a different connotation. Yeah. But yeah. <clears throat> bearing in mind that she was probably fifteen, sixteen at the time. I don't know. So the next bit we get to see Ernie Hudson Three. playing Winston Zemmour. Washington, um, oh. in his plough like vehicle. So again, spent a bit of money in making that. Another toy. <clears throat> exactly. Um, we know that there's history there they're building up they're, are they friends are the enemies frenemies we know they're going to work together at some, at point. some point but they leave them and then again they go to this abandoned building they have a night there strange noises and we get these strange fat people that are hanging from the ceiling like um, the vampire weird, bats this the, the weird oh no it's just one of the weird little kid people no 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 no, 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 no. no, no these, these are the fat people I did, go, I did go for a wee, maybe I missed that bit. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's, I mean, it's, it's over, it's over in a minute. Yeah. Yeah, so well, again, the way, the way they edit it, it's like 10 seconds yeah, over. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and again, there's just some weird It things. might be how I have to edit this podcast. Because you keep turning away from the mic. <laughs> wow. Maybe that's why, they, why the editing is so bad on this one. They couldn't get the, act, the actors to stay near under the boom. But again, there's oh. no real build-up. And the Ranger action boys. is over within a couple of minutes. And they slide down ropes, and they're off. And that's it. That's it. Well, I read that. That's kind of par for the course for the entire film. They get in to a scrape <clears throat> yeah. where there's no real danger, and then they get out again. Yeah. And I, I read on a production note thing of this on on the Blu-ray that um basically Empire Strikes Back had Lando Calrissian, and they were like, right, we need a black actor because Star Wars has got one now. <laughs> And that was basically how that character was changed to whatever he was Shoot originally. Yeah. Yeah. But it was like Star Wars have got one of those. There was almost like a Star Wars checklist and a Space Hunter checklist. And it was like, right, desert. Yeah. Strange, strange vehicles, robot, pr- princesses. 
black dude. Cool black dude. <laughs> it was like, so yeah, which is good and bad, but you know, Hollywood's moved on a bit now. Mm. Well, extent. hopefully they wouldn't have called him Washington. <laughs> yeah, he'd have a cooler name now. Well, what, he could pick his own name now because he's that cool. Anyway, the chemist shows the women to the overdog, who we see for the first time as a cross between Skeletor, Skeletor the Kurgan, and Doc Terror from the Centurions cartoon, <laughs> played by the legendary Michael Ironside who is trying his hardest to make the most out of what he's given in this film. Um, Wolf and Nicky arrive at a flooded industrial area and Nicky is pulled underwater by an Amazonian warrior. Wolf tries to rescue her and gets trapped in a net. A large water snaky dragon emerges and scares the Amazons away. So in repayment for saving them, Wolf shoots it and realises... Releases. Um, releases, sorry, Nikki. They climb to freedom, but they've lost the scrambler and now must continue on foot. Because, you know, where do you lose a huge car? But we'll find out. They're escaping. I know, but like, you know, oh, the car's gone. Oh, no. Eventually, they are found by Washington and Wolf. With the tables turned, now begs for help. They finally agree to a 50-50 split of the reward of the mega credits <laughs> as Washington's ship is out of service. Two scab bikers arrive, the, the two brothers from earlier, and are set at camp as a deformed Molotov cocktail-wielding child. Sure well, I was going to change it. Uh, two scout bikers arrive and they set up camp as deformed and Molotov cocktail wielding children appear on the cliffs above them. They start attacking and Wolf, Nikki, Washington and the scouts escape in their vehicles in spectacular ways. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> just well, we see the here's some jeopardy. Let's talk about the positives. <clears throat> We've got some jowers. Yeah. We finally get to see the overdog. Yep. And I think, you know, they made a good effort of making him look a bit mean. Well, he looks terrifying. Yeah. But it's just the fact that he can't move. He can <laughs> move. He's just on the big he's crane. He's a hydraulic thing. lift yeah. type yeah. thing. Um, uh, and then, as Damien said before, it's another scene where they set up. Look, And the set looks good. Amazon warriors come out of nowhere. And really quickly, Wolf goes in to rescue... Uh, gets trapped, big snake appears, and then he shoots snake, and then they're off. Yeah, that's it. There's no talking to the Amazonian women, really. No, they, they no, no they finding could, out their motivation. They say they, they could use him for breeding if he could survive it, and he makes. Oh, some he makes some quick about that. I'm willing to take that bet or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. Played play by the legendary wrestler Reggie Bennett, by the way, the main leader. I did, I did never knew that until then. I was like, oh my god! But yeah, okay. And, and then they run off. We get the walking scenes in the like Salt Lake. Yeah, this yeah. is the RT three PO rip off yeah. it with the, almost the same kind of music. Um, and then yeah, we get the scene with the little kids, the little Jawas, um, and they throw Molotov cocktails, but they quickly escape. Well, what I was gonna put in as well was the bit about they make that sort of weird, yeah, sort of whistling sort of weird tune singing thing, before. thing, aren't they? And then, because you see one, then another one appears, and then another one appears, and then they're all there, and everyone's like, oh, isn't this pretty? And then they, like, start catch up bobbing them. Yeah. <laughs> Again, for no apparent reason. Yeah. yeah. I'm guessing just everyone works <laughs> for the overdog. Well, we find out, yeah. They, they say... Do they, though? I thought... Every... Well, I don't know. That's <laughs> the only thing I can think of why anyone they meet, or just... Wolf is just like such a piece of shit. Everyone yeah. just wants everyone to knows who he is. Eyes oh, that fucking wolf guy. Yeah, so was, I think it's Nikki that said that the chemist has been experimenting on them, and she doesn't want the chemist to catch her because he doesn't want her to experiment on her. Uh, but yeah, in in the blink of an eye, they escape. Mm. Okay, so now our team Wolf and Washington um, sneak into Overdog's fortress, where they find the zone is entertained by captured prisoners. 
forced to run through a deadly maze of needful obstacles, hazards and traps with the overdog as a kind of a compare slash MC. So it's yeah, it's basically satellite TV, isn't it? And in deck he's replaced <laughs> um, with their version of the running man. Wolf spots the women I'm a bit... prisoner, get me out of here. <laughs> Wolf spots the women being held on occasion, forms a rescue plan. But literally Nikki's been in the um, vehicle for a couple of seconds and gets bored. So um, she decides to snoop around. She's captured and sent into the maze. Wolf and Washington start their sabotage and breakout plan, but Wolf spots Nikki in the maze and tries to rescue her. This is where Nikki has managed to find some new skills and agility and cunning that we didn't know that we had uh, that she had, and she manages to reach the end of the maze. Um, she does get a little bit of help from Wolf's blaster at one point, uh, but she does a lot of it. On her own. She yep. beats most of the other people that have gone before her. It's feisty in this one, there is. Yeah. Um, Overdog congratulates her. Um, and whilst he originally promised her freedom, decides he doesn't want that anymore because he's a bad one, and drags her back to his lair. She's hooked up to a machine that's built to drain, uh, drain away her life energy. And Overdog uses her vitality to recharge his body. Yeah. I can't believe the baddie lied. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, Who knew that was coming? And so, the, and so it's the bit that made me laugh and you just read it out. You were like, he, um, what do you Well, spots the women in the cage and forms a rescue plan. He walks straight over <laughs> and lets them out next to Overdog. Yeah. <laughs> and no one bad an eye did. Yeah. Oh, we get, no, we get a little fight on the bridge, don't we? That's right. Yeah. 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 Uh, there, there's, yeah, there's some fun going along. Um, yeah, but that, the guy from used to be on Who signs it anyway. I forgot his name now. Um, he's the guard. I didn't uh, know. His. I didn't know Greg Proops. He's Canadian. John Sims? No, something Sims. Doesn't Greg, matter. Yeah. Move on. Um, so the sets. Peter good. Sissons. No. The sets good. Um, Paul Merton. Sorry, yeah, it's Paul. very. Very thunder, thunder domey. Yeah. Yeah, and then we get some special effects where he's draining her life force. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Colin mockery. <clears throat> Great. Okay. Yeah, I know you mean now. Bad. But um, bad. yeah. So <clears throat> and um, yeah, it was. Where? I didn't really feel that she was in any real sense of peril. No. That's because um, she's so wily and cunning. Yeah, and Overdog just didn't seem to be able to do much. It was, he's about as effective as a Dalek, or an old Dalek. You know, if you went up a flight of stairs, if he wasn't on this special crane thing, he wouldn't be able to do it. Yeah, I think we find out that he rules by terror as opposed to actually Moving physically <laughs> doing anything. <laughs> and it's more the fact that the chemist is basically turning everyone into mutants that, that's helping him. And yeah, he's got his own guards that aren't very good. They're worse than stormtroopers. Yeah. Because they don't even fire most of the time. They just more let people come up to them and then. Yeah, most oh. of them all got took out with like one punch. Yeah. Hey, it was the 80s. That's what happened. <laughs> yeah. Even in the Forbidden Zone. Yeah. yeah. Right. That's why it's the Forbidden Zone. Because it's, it's just. Forbidden yeah. for throwing two yeah. punches. Okay. <laughs> So we crack on. Damien, let's bring this to an end. Tell us how it ends. <laughs> Wolf comes to the rescue, squashes the chemist, then takes on Overdog, telling Nikki to hang in there. Brilliant. Another great one-liner. Mm -hmm. Overdog, and the thing is, it's signpost. You just know that line's coming. Overdog catches Wolf, and when all looks lost, he jabs a sparking power cable into one of Overdog's claws. The power feedback fries Overdog and causes a chain reaction of explosions throughout the fortress, as opposed to a Chanson reaction, which is written here. <laughs> as the fortress explodes around them, Wolf and Nikki run for cover and are rescued by Washington, who is driving the plow with Nova, Rena and Megan driving another commandeered vehicle. They all race out of the fortress just as it explodes behind them. Back in a safe spot, Wolf invites Nikki to stay with him and she agrees since they made good partners. They hug and take off in Wolf's spaceship. With yeah. everyone else. Yeah. Yeah. 
<clears throat> Why did everything blow up? Because he's this. he's basically attached to everything. So if he goes, if he goes, whole, everything, the whole goes whole house of cards there. comes crumbling yeah. down. It's, it's, a trigger, oh, it's got like a yeah. trigger switch, and it looks good in three D. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But there's not much of a fight, really, is there? Um, there's not much of anything. It kind of what as I say, he walks in there next to him, and he gets about the cage thing. And I think I think as I said, that may have been one of. Um, Overdog's real criticisms is that he couldn't have a real big fisty cough fight because he's got big claws and he's attached to a yeah, big crane. You know, like whichever move he's going to make is signposted <laughs> yeah. twenty minutes before he makes it. Yeah, and um, yeah, so they get out, and it's quite obvious that Nikki is going to stay with Wolf. Yeah, we? so we get this elongated. Oh, they're all talking about their adventures yeah. and what they're going to do. I'm going to go and sulk off in this corner. Like a four-year-old, where I can yeah. still turn around and see Emo. if they're looking at me or not. And, uh, and then they hug for what seemed like a really, really long time. I guess in, <laughs> almost, almost a gone with the wind moment. Yeah. She, she's the daughter that <coughs> he's gonna pay alimony on, I guess. Yeah. Well, yeah, I don't hug my daughters like like that. Yeah, yeah. You're yeah. not an intergalactic trash space ranger. Yeah. Though, yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I'd be calling social services at this point if I was Washington to say... <laughs> I would have called them long before this. <laughs> you, you, may, you may just need to keep an eye on this relationship, OK? Um, but hey, it was predictable. We know it's going to happen. So just before we go into um, thoughts, it should be pointed out that a couple of weeks after filming, the original de- director and a lot of the um, crew were basically fired because the uh, production company weren't happy about the, the progress of the film. Um, and, and that's where the new director came on board and maybe, shall we say, there was a, a constant rewriting and evolution of scripts as as the film went along. You may have gathered some of that from your watching. Um, but yeah, I've just thrown it out there. Um, <laughs> Um, so anyway um, Damien yes what did Brett think so so, so Brett coming to you what what did you think Brett this I just can't work out how they got it wrong because this said I can tell you I can tell you no but this was a studio backed project which had a decent enough cast in it and they were gunning for the Star Wars throne, which we all know is stupid to do, but they were trying, you know, aim high. And they clearly had a, a sustainable enough special effects department for the time of what people were working with compared to other films at the time. And, you know, you've got Michael Ironside as a villain. Only Hudson's hanging around as the kind of cool psychic guy who knows a bit more than he lets on and he's probably got a past um, Peter Strauss was more a Broadway kind of guy wasn't he from what I've read mm-hmm. and Molly Ringwald was about to become the nation's sweetheart so they could have you know she could have been Princess Leah before she was 16 candles but for some reason they just had all of these things juggling in the air and dropped a lot of them and I, that's that's what's the more shocking thing about it there was even, on the production thing, on the, the Blu-ray I watched, they even made a making of this as a TV series <laughs> and had it on America like you could watch the episode before the film came out. But they were pushing this like it was Star Wars. Mm. And then everyone went in and watched that. So it was, you know, it wasn't like one of the, the amount of times we've sat here and gone, if the studio was behind it, this could have been better. They were. They were that. Maybe they were too much in it, like you say, if they were like 800 script writers at the end. And well, I don't know whether there's 800 script writers or a lot no, of no, rewriting well, yeah, going yeah, on. Yeah, you know what I mean, that sort of thing. I don't know, <laughs> but but apparently Molly Ringwald was happier because when she got the original script, she didn't like it, but was hoping that she'd be able to change it as she went along because she liked the idea, just not her dialogue. And then later on, they did, and she was happy. So, again, is it... Like you say, the editing is a good point. Scott Conrad, you editor. I wonder, <laughs> is there like 
do we think that we're going to get the the Johnson cut? So no, I no amount so. of re-editing will make this film good. But yeah, it's just something where I don't think there's ever been a film that everyone has actually been on board with trying to make it a hit and trying to make it something good with a decent enough cast and just dropping it so badly. Okay, Damien. It's shit. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 seriously. Tell us what you really think. The editing is awful. The script is terrible. The acting is woolly at best. It's either hammy, Mr. Ironside, or it's just kind of phoned in, Mr. Strauss. There's no establishing anything. It just lurches from one scenario of supposed jeopardy to the next. They spend about 20 minutes of the film in the Forbidden Zone. Forbidden Zone, yeah. And no time in space. So the title makes no fucking sense whatsoever. Yeah. It's <clears> just <throat> shit. There you go. Cool. Okay. So I've already explained the fact that, you know, the original director and a lot of the crew were asked to leave. So, yeah, there's the, the, the scripts. Yeah, were a bit um, fluid. Um, variety at the time. Um, so called it a muddled science fiction tale whose editing prevented audiences from enjoying the well-shot action scenes. However, I didn't think the action scenes were that well shot. Um, well, they probably were. That's the point. So, you, you know, what you I said earlier... To see how well shot they yeah, were. No, exactly. you know, the pirate so, so... ship thing. He's on the pirate ship. He swings across. He lands on deck. And the next minute, he's down below deck shooting up at people. That's why the editing makes it so shit. Yeah, but, but as I said, we'll never know how much footage there was and whether it was just editing or whether it wasn't actually shot properly. Um, there was one nice bit in there where we actually found that, you know, that the whole laser blasters are useless if you've got a mirror. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I can see why I really loved it as a child, because it is just... Action sequence, not yeah, much right, going on. Made not that, much dialogue. It? Next action sequence, not much dialogue. Next action sequence, is, over. Is that? Yeah, maybe we're looking at and this cool, wrong. And cool spaceships. Is and, this, and, is this basically you? You you just reframed <clears throat> this for me, Paul, in what you said. <laughs> He's had a revelation. <laughs> no, but is this basically? It's for kids. Like, yeah, are they? Is this just some sort of Power Rangers in space stuff where? We don't need a sound effect. We just need an explosion, fight, explosion, fight, jump Bad around, guy. do that, cool, cool, cool that. There's cool, a car. Cool action figure. But there's too much of the trying to make a plot, though, I think, to throw it off as much. And, and either way... So we think that maybe that's what the studio were going for. That's why they wanted a You're just making excuses. <laughs> You're making excuses for a shit film. I'm just trying to work out how they dropped the balls of that. Well, yeah. Because <laughs> they hired the wrong people to do it. Yeah. So... Peter I, I, Strauss, is it Peter? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Peter Strauss, just not right as a space ranger, anti-hero type rebel. It doesn't fit him. Do you know who should the have editor been... should be hung, drawn and quartered. Do you know who should have been um, Wolf? And who would have done it better and made him a bit more harsh and a bit more cold, which I think he should Harrison have been. Harrison Ford? Michael Ironside. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no. That's the only bit of casting that's kind of right. Uh, unfortunately, he hams it up too much. Well, he probably didn't have much to go no. with. Like, no, he hasn't got a lot to work with. He was literally yeah. strung up. Yeah. Yeah. Like, growl. He was left, left, hung out to dry. <laughs> growl. Yeah, he, well, he probably gets five lines of the whole yeah. film. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, as I mentioned, it's there's not much in the way of plot. It's just a few set action sequences and literally cutting from one to another. Which is probably why I liked it as a kid. Um, but unfortunately, um, I'm not a kid anymore. So, <laughs> Brad. Oh, oh, yeah, and one of the other production notes. When Annie Hudson signed on, he was told Jeff Bridges was playing Wolf. 
Yeah. And then Peter Strauss got the role. <laughs> so yeah. Ooh. Yeah, you can see how that might work and that would add go, different dimensions. Go, go some Tron. Yeah. Yeah. But, but again, you don't really care about any of the characters. You know, you don't have any of the storyline or the build up. You're not fussed about them. They, they, they try with Nikki, but again, the fact that her parents are literally in a UFO that she's standing 10 feet away and seems not to know or recognise that fact. You, you just don't care. Yeah, she's not that sympathetic, is she? Because she comes across more as like, no, they're just going stroppy, for that stroppy, typical, moody, stroppy, disassociated kid from the 80s. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but there are, uh, most characters like that in those films have a soft edge that you warm to. She doesn't really have that. She has a sulky edge that's supposed to be come across as vulnerability, but it doesn't. It just comes across as being a small little shit. They're annoying. Yeah, like Peppa Pig. <laughs> <laughs> Pigs in space. <laughs> okay, Summers. Let, let's do it. Out of ten. <clears throat> Ooh. Three, and most of those are for Annie and Mike. And the fact that it was 3D, so we've lost some of the impact. <laughs> Here we go, another excuse. No, but I can remember Michael Ironsons before I realised who Michael Ironsons was swaying at me in 3D. I think that was part of if we put him on a crane and freak him out, that'll be it, and yeah. they forgot to take him off. <laughs> Even if that last scene, we'd like, right, we're going to fight. And then he kind yeah, of yeah. disconnects and steps like, down. Like aliens. Yeah, sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. But no. Okay, Damien. Two. Okay. And that's just for, because the effects are actually pretty decent. The vehicles, like you said, mentioned earlier. The, you know, all of that stuff is good. It's just badly put together, the script is shit, editing's awful. So it gets a two, and that's a push. I'm going to give it a four. Um, I'm going to give it a point for the sets, which I actually think were, were, were pretty damn yeah. good, actually. Uh, I'm going to give it a point for the vehicles, because they, they spent a lot of time and money making those, and, and getting ready to sell them as toys. <laughs> And then in my eight-year-old self has given them two points from inside. Fair enough. Because as a kid, I think this actually still holds <laughs> up. <Yeah. laughs> my, my inner child was actually yeah. watching this going, this is great, this is great. My adult self was saying, shut up. It's past your bedtime. It's almost 11 o'clock. Go to sleep. Um, but yeah, it, it's more of that reminiscence type thing. As opposed to anything else, so I'm giving it a four. I was a little bit disappointed. Okay, okay. so that has been episode 103, where we've shone or we've tried to shine our spotlight. Maybe a little too bright uh, <laughs> on this particular. Is it the lowest ranked film we've I think ever it done? Is. I think what I'm gonna have to do is is give you all, give you both like a chunk of podcasts to listen to to write down the scores because I just can't do it okay. so we're at some point we'll sort that out so that that was the spotlight on Space Hunter Adventures in Forbidden Zone hey but you know we've watched it and critiqued it so that maybe you don't have to apologies to those listeners and viewers that watched the long yeah you can't get a refund if you brought it on <laughs> Apple. I'm sorry we're not responsible for payments but hey maybe you do have a small child that, that would be um, enjoy it uh, find this film enjoyable if it was if they were actually living in the 80s still who knows <laughs> so uh, before we go through this shutdown procedures um obviously you know uh, it was my chance mm. this week it was your chance to shine and you failed <laughs> oh, did I? That's, that, that is the point of the podcast you know um so whose turn is it for next week Me. Oh, it's, oh it's brett yeah so brett should go one way or the other yeah well, Mr. Summers, what, what are we watching for I'm, the next week? I'm going to give you a choice, because I, I, it was a choice of two, but now I've got a choice of three. So, because I was trying to... And you can tell us one, down. two or three. And tell well, us. What, no, no, what I'm going to do, there is a horror-ishy one, a mm -hmm. sci-fi, and a sort of revenge thriller. I can't take any more sci-fi. Not after this week. Is it a good horror? Have you seen this film recently? Yes. 
It's a very, very good. I wouldn't, I, I, I wouldn't mind the horror if it's good. I'm not for that. As long as it's not sci-fi, I can't take any more Avengers in space <laughs> that aren't in space or in the Forbidden Zone. It's just in a desert with some trees. Yeah. <laughs> okay, then. Then next week, we will be watching the horror film that everyone should have watched. It's called Behind the Mask, The Rise of Leslie Vernon. Oh, yeah, cool. I've seen this. And it is Did we talk about this? Yeah. Well, I'd say a, while, a little while ago. It was probably two years ago now. Yeah, and it is done, I think it's okay, it's done as a kind of, I guess, <clears throat> documentary, but a, yeah, or yeah. a mockumentary, if you will, about this woman who's making documentary on serial killers, yeah. and horror killers, and <clears throat> it unfolds through that. It unfolds. What's it's it available? on Amazon. You can rent it for four forty. Well, on Amazon now, because it's. How was it on Shadow originally? It's because yeah. it's been so long. On Amazon, there is a like tenth anniversary edition now, because it's and um, but you can rent it from three forty nine. Although when you click on it, oh, four forty nine in hard high definition. Okay. And you can buy it for eight ninety nine. And on all the other various platforms, you can pick up the DVD for about two quid on eBay as well. I think that works. <laughs> but um, yes, behind the mask, the rise of Leslie Vernon. Um, it featured uh, directed by. Scott they, 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 we don't need that. We don't need this. That's the point of next week. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I think oh, I, yeah. I only watched it last year, but I don't mind watching it again. Oh, he's just, just very enthusiastic about well, that. Well, yeah, I, I thought he was going to pick one from the 70s or the oh, 80s or right, something. Okay. Yeah, but point, now you wish you'd gone for the revenge. I do, yeah. <laughs> but hey, we, we've got that. Well, right. it'll, it'll come s- round. It'll stay on. It'll yeah. stay on the list. Cool. Cool. Okay, um, so time to start the shutdown procedures or whatever we call it. Um, so this has been 103, Spotlight on Space Hunter Adventures in the Forbidden Zone, the longest film ever made. That title, that is. I was going to say yeah, uh, I've been Paul Hawkins. Thanks for listening or watching on YouTube. As oh. always, we are available on multiple streaming services, pretty much everyone. But yeah, thanks to all our YouTube li- uh, watchers that, that seem to be enjoying Picking, the content. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, don't forget to check out the Mothership for more content, reviews, links to, to news items, all that kind of good stuff, which is Brett. Cultfaction.com or click in the links. Yeah, that's right, and subscribe. <laughs> and subscribe and add and share. Yeah, and if you do have any comments, obviously you can make those on all the different streaming services out there. But if you want that more personal touch, then you can use the old fashioned way of emailing with our email address, Damien, which is cultfactionpodcast at mail.com. Cool, I've been Paul Hawkins, your host for this evening, and I've been joined by. Brett Summers, Damien Hicks. Thanks for listening. Overdog. Thanks for watching. Goodbye. Farewell.